are you clicking it? We're live now, Pat. Okay. Hello and welcome to a very special live stream simulcast coming to you from the Marine Institute. Apologies if you tuned in a few moments ago, slight technical issues, but we are now absolutely live on Facebook, on Twitter and on YouTube. Now, wherever you're watching across the world, it's a very good morning to you. It's a very good afternoon to you and it's a very good evening to you. Now, this is a very special arrangement from the Marine Institute. I better tell you a little bit about them before we talk to our special guest. The Marine Institute is the national agency responsible to the Irish government for advice on and implementation of marine research, technology, development and innovation policy, and also marine research services. And today, as I say, we have a, a great exclusive interview to bring you. Joining us from the United States, from Columbus, Ohio, is one of the most wonderful people it's been my uh, pleasure to encounter, and that's Kathy Sullivan. Now, I'd like to spare her blushes, but I won't. I have to tell you a little bit about her. Um, she might have been a linguist, but that's not what she is, even though she's come out of a great number of languages. Uh, she might have been an oceanographer and explored the deep, but that's not how she spent the bulk of her working life. But no talent, no skill is wasted. So in fact, um, that came in useful a little bit later on. She became an astronaut and spent most of her working life on the NASA space program. She was the first American woman ever to walk in space. And also she was involved in the deployment of that fantastic astronomical creation, the Hubble telescope, and we'll be talking all about that. If you're joining us live, well, there's an opportunity to get copies of Kathy's uh, books. All you have to do is tell us where you're tuned in and we will be uh, selecting via our social media team, the winners of those uh, books. Kathy, um, it's good morning to you in Columbus, Ohio, and it's good afternoon uh, to you from uh, Dublin in Ireland. Now, um, I mentioned that you're the first uh, American woman to walk in space. With a name like Sullivan, I think there must be some Irish in you that can take some credit for that. Oh, there's just a little bit, don't you? And I'd let me give a shout out since we're at it to my cousins, Margaret and Nora, who may well be watching down outside of Kenmare in County Kerry. Okay, and there are other uh, members of the family because I think all four arms of your family are Irish, but we, we leave that there for the moment. Now, every bit, I, every single bit. <laughs> every bit of you, your entire genome is, is Irish. Now, let, let's talk about how you became an astronaut because that's not how you started out in college. There was no ambition, I want to be, I want to be, I want to be an astronaut. So how did it happen? Well, I had certainly watched the astronauts uh, growing up. That would have been in my starting when I was about 10. Uh, and at the same time, of course, Jacques Cousteau, a very intrepid explorer, was pushing back the frontiers of the oceans and revealing all of that to us on television magazines. Uh, I didn't know what I wanted to be, but I saw in the lifestyles and the adventures and the inquisitiveness that lay behind the astronaut program and, and Cousteau as well, uh, I saw I was enthralled by that. I mean, what exciting, interesting, you know, always curious lives they had. So I knew I wanted that, whatever that chemistry is that lets your life be the way I, the lives I was seeing. Um, I didn't know what you called something that let you have a life like that. But uh, when I was around 10 or 11 years old, uh, I recognized and discovered with the help of a family friend uh, that I had a certain flair for languages. So my first theory, if you will, my first game plan for how do I get to be inquisitive and curious and learn all about the earth was, well, bank on a talent for languages and then build build from there and see where it can take you. Now, that's what you uh, went to college to do, to do languages. But happily, I suppose, for all of us, um, there was a, a need to take electives. Now, I know when I was doing scientific subjects in Georgia Tech, I had to take uh, artistic or arts electives. You had to take, as a linguist, you had to take scientific electives. And, and there was the turning point. Yeah, very much so. I, I argued heartily against needing to fulfill that requirement for three courses in the first year. Uh, and I will agree with you happily, I lost all those arguments. Uh, I had a French advisor who had scouted out classes that were you know, interesting, well-taught, and not too hard for language majors to pass. So he recommended three, uh, and two of them happened to be marine science courses. First, a broad sweep in marine biology, 
that was aimed at both people who would major in the field and the likes of me. Uh, and then my final term of that year, a broad oceanography course. The professors in both cases were quite young profs. I, they couldn't have been more than three or four years into their teaching career. So you're really not that much older than those of us that, that were in their classes. They were energetic, they were dynamic, they were passionate about their subjects. And every weekend they were trucking us off down to the shore or up into the mountains to actually do geology and do biology. You see something we'd never encountered before. And instead of running to a textbook to look up what it means and get the right answer, uh, helping us learn how to observe and think and reason and, as I say, build an answer to something new instead of just go looking one up. It was exactly the kind of vibrant, energetic uh, experience that I remembered having seen in Cousteau and the astronauts. So, you know, I compared the likely pathways of a linguist who wanted to travel to lots of places and the likely pathway of a geologist or oceanographer. Someone was always buying these people airline tickets to go off and study a mountain or join a ship somewhere. I decided I'm going with them. Now, um, that could have been your career, but even before you graduated, uh, there was an ad for female astronaut candidates uh, because the shuttle program was being developed and, right. and you, you applied. Did you have any real expectation or was it just one of those things, ah, they're looking for females, I'm a female, I'll apply? Well, I was urged to apply by my brother who kept saying there can't be that many 26-year-old PhDs in the female PhDs in the world, try. Uh, the penny dropped when I stopped thinking about how impossible it would be to do my kind of oceanography from orbital altitudes and recognized the job NASA was hiring for was basically expedition manager in a sense. Uh, the shuttle, when I, when I conceived of the shuttle as a research ship in space, then it made sense to me and I could make some really useful comparisons with all the research expeditions I had done at sea, starting my fourth year of university. I loved the expeditionary part of oceanography, planning them, going out to sea, continuously adapting to what life throws at you. It's never quite what you had in your plan. Uh, I was good at it uh, and knew I loved it. And NASA was looking for that skill set to apply on a research vessel that would go into orbit. So that's what suggested to me it makes some sense. It's plausible that I could be qualified to do this because I do know how to do that stuff. Then the question was, well, but why else would you really want to shift gears and go in that direction? And for me, that was a very simple answer. If somehow I beat all the numerical odds and got selected out of the thousands that would apply, I would actually get to look back at Earth from orbit with my own eyes instead of forever in my life studying other astronauts' pictures. And that part was just irresistible. Now, I, I've been reading um, in your book, which is called Handprints on Hubble, and uh, we, we'll actually be talking about Hubble in a few minutes' time. But it does seem as if you were almost born to this, because even when you're uh, you know, trying to create the weightless environment on Earth, and then when you go into space, um, it just seemed, well, reading your book, it seems like you felt absolutely at home. Well, I did, and I, you know, I can't quite explain that. It's... Uh... My curiosity just tends to propel me into things and I stay very immersed in them. Uh, certainly my first few moments, my first day probably in orbit on my first flight, I was just as zero, zero G clumsy as every rookie is. You've, you've not gotten quite accustomed yet to how gentle and refined your movements want to be. Uh, anyone on the broadcast who's ever hopped in the ocean and scuba dived will remember the same thing of first sort of flailing about a bit and then over time, smoothing out your emotions and becoming really quite graceful underwater. You have the same thing happen when you're adjusting to zero gravity. Uh, but you know, I think part of another part of it is the training and preparation you do uh, either before you head out to sea or before you go off on a space mission. You've made yourself so deeply familiar with the ship, with the craft, with how it works, with you know, where your gear is going to be, with how it's all set up. So it's a, it's a very novel experience once you get underway. Uh, but you built all that. It's it's not like you suddenly plopped into it as a passenger. You've been working a long time preparing and building all of this, and so it is quite familiar to you when you when you set off. Um, the the countdown, I would imagine, as a, a non astronaut, it would be terrifying and intimidating, and so on. 
It's not how you describe it, though. And occasionally when the countdown has had to stop, it's, it's a matter of irritation to the astronauts. There is no relief there at all. You, you just want to get out of the Earth's atmosphere, get up there. Um, but even the first launch, I mean, was there any sense of being scared at all? I was just eager to go. We've been training and preparing for such a long time to do this. And there, there are so many, you know, so many glitches, so many events external to your flight that can trip up your schedule and delay you again and again. Uh, it so it takes a lot of patience and perseverance to get to the point that you're suited up and going out to the launch pad. Uh, and, you, you know, I think we were all just eager to get on and start to reap the yield of all the investments that we we and the scientists whose equipment we were carrying, a huge team that's made a huge investment to get to that point. And you really want to go forward and fulfill it. So we always used to say, if there's any technical issue during a countdown, if there's any remaining question of, well, what do you think? Should we go today? Or uh, is it a day that we should stay home? You, would ne you, know, you really never want to ask the crew in the spacecraft because they just want to go. It's been a, it's been a, a demanding, exacting, almost full day's work just getting to the countdown moment. And, and it's not real comfortable sitting on your back, tilted up on your back on a launch pad for hours on end. So if I go that way, I get really comfortable in eight and a half minutes because I'm in zero gravity. And if you, know, if you make us back out of all of this, it's another several hours work. Now, we have a question from Emer Manning, who's Ireland's All-Atlantic Ocean Youth Ambassador. And um, she says, you've boldly gone where no woman has ever gone before. What inspired and motivated you to become an explorer? That's going back to your childhood, that very itch. Do you know where that came from? Did it come from your dad, from your mom? I, I think it was inborn, but it, it was definitely encouraged and groomed and, and supported by both of my parents. Uh, they also emphasized to both my brother and I, uh, you, you're allowed to be interested in anything you're interested in. No one gets to tell you. No, no one gets to tell you what you shouldn't be interested in or edit what you're interested in. So we were very free range kids in that sense, able to explore anything we wanted. And I did explore a lot of things that you wouldn't have said were typical little girl things to do. But that's what that's what I was passionate about. That's what I was curious about. Uh, another question, and uh, this one from Hugo Johnson in Crockwell in County Galway, who's 10 years old, and he wants to know, um, what does a spacewalk feel like? Ah, well, it doesn't feel like walking at all if you're working around the space shuttle or the International Space Station, because you're predominantly moving with your hands. There, there are handles and grips placed all outside the, the station and the shuttle that are, that are put there just for you to be able to maneuver around on. So it's uh, if you've ever swum underwater, I imagine being able to swim underwater perfectly, not popping to the surface, not sinking to the bottom, and never having to wor worry how, how to breathe, because you can swim through air. You can move with the touch of a finger. Um, it's, a, it's a really very fun, wonderful feeling. Now, I mentioned the Hubble telescope, which is uh, the real subject matter of your book. And the idea of a Hubble telescope um, being a telescope that didn't exist on Earth, because the atmosphere of the Earth kind of gets in the way of clarity of, of the pictures. So whose idea was it and how did it come to pass? Yeah, it, uh, the atmosphere not only can get in the way of good pictures, you know, blocking with clouds or being turbulent, but there's some wavelengths of light that the atmosphere blocks completely. So you cannot study a star or a galaxy in the ultraviolet from Earth. You have to get above the atmosphere. Uh, the, the idea of being able to escape the bounds of Earth and be free from birds and dust and clouds, uh, I think goes all the way back to some of Galileo's writings and he knew the limitations of the telescope that he built in the 1600s. Uh, the I first idea of putting a telescope in orbit is credited to a German researcher named Hermann Obart back in the late 1920s. Uh, you know, no one had the engineering skill or capacity at that point to make that any kind of real prospect. But it was, you know, visionaries in the science fiction sense. It comes back again in 1946, thanks to a Princeton astronomer named Lyman Spitzer, as the Second World War was winding down. Uh, the White House in the United States asked leading scientists what should we now do with this, this capacity that was built to win the war? There were rockets and airplanes and, and a vast mobilization of talent 
should we just let that all go back to what it had been doing before? Should we apply it to some new purposes? Uh, and Lyman picked up the idea again of a telescope in space, which now could about just about be realized with the engineering capability and laid out a very detailed case how big the mirror should be, what that would let you do, what kind of instruments, and why would that be worthwhile in terms of under, not just understanding stars and galaxies beyond the Earth, but also understanding uh, the Earth's own atmosphere. Now, for people who are not familiar with the Hubble telescope, the idea that it would bring us pictures the like of which we've never seen, that was actually borne out, in fact. But the Hubble is the size of a school bus, I learned from your book, weighs 11,000 kilos or more. Yeah. Uh, it's a hell of a payload to get into space. And then you've got to deploy its solar wings to power it and all of that. It's just a magnificent technical achievement. It, it was a remarkable technical achievement. Uh, the, the cadre of people that designed Hubble, uh, I, I was stunned as I did the research for the book, absolutely floored at how precise and insightful their foresight was. They're really doing laying the groundwork for Hubble in the middle 1960s. Well, there almost isn't a space age yet in the middle 1960s. The engineers that are starting the process of making this magical telescope, their engineering background was at best in airplanes, mostly it was in cars and motorcycles. And yet they're thinking ahead with such clarity to this thing that has never existed before what does it need to be able to do? And just as importantly, we've got to design its layout so that astronauts in big bulky spacesuits can actually go repair it like the mechanic can repair your car. But at the time they're imagining that, there have only ever been two spacewalks done in the world and they both were dis near disasters. I mean, the Russian cosmonaut really almost did die because no one really knew how to set up all the practicalities so that a spacewalker could do meaningful work. But here are these guys nonchalantly say, oh yeah, school bus size, no problem. And maintainable, sure, swap out instruments, do this and that. These guys in these big bulky spacesuits, yeah, we can do that. It was just amazing. It took 20 some years just to get it built and tested uh, and ready to be taken to orbit in the space shuttle. It was finally deployed, and you were involved in that deployment. Uh, and then you get back to Earth, and it's you know terrific, great. And then it's switched on, and the pictures are blurry. Uh, with what kind of dismay was that greeted? Oh, it was a really crushing day uh, for for NASA, certainly. And this multi-billion-dollar instrument that's been getting worked on forever. Uh, at, huge community of astronomers eager to have it work. And they tried every bit of focusing trick they could and finally had to realize that the 2.4 meter diameter, eight meter diameter, eight foot diameter mirror was ever so slightly the wrong shape. Uh, and it was at first just crushing, a huge disappointment. And of course the press and, and comedians and members of Congress just jumped all over NASA. How could you, how you how could you make such a fundamental mistake on such an important payload? Um, so it was a very dark time, and uh, it really did seem for a while there that this could be a fatal blow uh, to NASA. Remember, it's just a couple of years after the loss of the space shuttle Challenger, NASA's reputation is still sort of being redeemed from that horrible accident, and now you've mucked up this thing. Yeah. Um, I mean, yeah, the, the headline fun. from uh, the headline from Newsweek was NASA's one point five billion dollar blunder, uh, yes. which you know puts it in a very stark um, headline for ordinary people to understand. But of course, um, the scientists they got together and they realized this is a a problem that can be solved by optics, and they designed yeah. something that corrected the Hubble. So there are two things there that were the key to that success. The first thing was, uh, you know, okay, so the bad news is you messed up, but the good news is you made a very precise mistake. And so just as your eye doctor can make a precise calculation of what optics will fix the light that your brain receives, you could make that calculation for Hubble. The next happy bit was uh, you, did not, you didn't actually have to fix the mirror itself. The realization was you have, to, you, you have to frame the problem correctly. Is our problem to fix the big mirror itself? That was clearly impossible. The problem is correct the light that bounces off the big mirror. 
And so that's where they took advantage of the maintenance capability. They already had large scientific instruments that were built to intercept the light and shine it onto their detectors. Let's take one of them out and in its place, let's install the optics that will correct the light and fix it for all the other instruments. And then in the years after, that fix was put in 1993. In later years on later repair missions, uh, the astronauts, uh, the engineers would build that correction into each new instrument. So the optics were corrected as the new instruments went up. Now, uh, what a, an extraordinary career uh, in space. But, you know, all good things must come to an end. And a another opportunity came your way um, and from a woman who's described as her deepness um, for you to actually change direction. And instead of going up to go down, what happened? Well, Sylvia Earle is uh, the woman who's often referred to as her deepness. She's a revered and renowned marine ecologist and a longtime friend of mine at that point. She was serving as chief scientist of our National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, uh, a broad agency that covers everything from weather forecasting to fisheries management. Uh, and the time had come for family reasons that she needed to step away from that post. And she wanted to put my name into, into the hat uh, as a consideration for her replacement. Uh, I, she called me up just as I was making preparations for my third space flight, it turned out to be my final flight. Uh, and I, you know, I had reached the point, I was kind of realizing, I was reaching the point where Earth was pulling me back. Uh, I had great, three great flights, um, was really, I think I was so struck by the power of the space perspective and as an Earth scientist, very aware of how the space vantage point uh, gives us such a such a boost on how we can understand and monitor this planet. And what I really cared about in that vein was how do you make that kind of tremendously valuable insight and information, how do you make it actually matter and be useful and be pertinent to life here on Earth? I, I don't want it just to be the spiffy astronaut vacation pictures that I brought home from my space flights. Uh, I This is really what I care about, that our understanding of the Earth can advance and we can make better decisions based on having better information about how our planet works. The uh, chief scientist got it. Uh, at Kathy, was a great I was wondering, Kathy, um, you know, bearing in mind what Michael Collins, the, the astronaut said, who of course piloted uh, the uh, ship that uh, orbited the moon, he said what struck him about the earth was its fragility. Uh, how did it strike you? I mean, when you look back, and at the beginning, I suppose, all rookies in space want to see the Earth and get the best angle possible. What was your immediate impression when you saw the blue planet from, for the first time from outside of the blue planet? Uh, it, it was truly breathtaking. I mean, it pulled the air right out of me and I blurted out. I mean, it was eight and a half minutes after we lifted off and I got my first glimpse. And I couldn't help myself. I just, wow, look at that was not the right moment for that digression, but that's a separate point. Um, you know, I kept back, I can imagine getting as far away from Earth as Mike and his colleagues did and seeing it as sort of a grapefruit sized thing in the distance, uh, that fragility might well be uh, what comes through, certainly uniqueness and elegance and specialness shine, really shine through. Uh, at the altitudes that we orbit, I, I came away with a both and. I mean, it clearly, the, the scale of our planet and the systems that drive it, ocean currents, atmospheric currents, major storms, they are huge and they are powerful. But at the same time, you can see some of the finest little filigree patterns in tendrils of an ocean current or in fil little filaments of dust that blow from the Sahara all the way across the Atlantic Ocean. Uh, and certainly the the symptoms and signs of human life on the surface of the planet that you can see look like very faint little sketches on a very large planet. You know, so my takeaway is that the planet is actually quite robust. The, the planet will, the planet will always be fine. The question is, will the planet always be able to support the abundance of life that it currently does and that we absolutely rely on from the plankton in the ocean up to every other living thing. It is the interconnections among all the systems of our planet uh, and the fine balance, the balance between those systems that make it all work. Uh, that's what can be toppled. 
Now, when you uh, did your last space flight and you knew that this uh, new job with uh, the uh, National Oceanographic and Atmospheric Agency was was yours, um, it brought me back to something I found in, in your book where when you're a, a young student about to graduate and you're talking to your mother about the possibility of becoming an astronaut or on the other hand, going into the deep and becoming an oceanographer. And she turned to you and she said, Kathy, is there nothing exciting that you can actually do at sea level? <laughs> um, so so the, the pull of the deep was always there. Um, did you, as a, I feel like an executive, an administrator, did you get early chances to go into the water and to do the thing that you might have done as a young graduate years before? Uh, I actually got my first chance to do a, a deep submersible dive while I was still an astronaut came in the hiatus after the Challenger accident. Uh, and another person I knew who had an aff affiliation with NOAA was going out to sea on one of their undersea research program cruises. Uh, we were sort of not, a, not as busy as usual in the astronaut corps since no flights were being prepared for, no training was underway. And so I was able to take a couple of weeks and go out to sea uh, with this crew um, off of Bermuda and dive in a submersible called Pisces to about 3,000 feet on the flanks of the Bermuda Seamount. So that was my first deep-ish dive. Um, there's a, a question here from um, one of our viewers, and it is uh, this one. As you descended to the depths of the ocean, did you see anything in the ocean that surprised you or excited you? Well, on most of the descents, I've done three deep descents. Uh, the one I just mentioned, one in Alvin on the East Pacific volcanic rise, and now the, the Challenger Deep. And in each of those cases, our destination was the bottom. There was scientific work we wanted to do you know, at that given depth. Uh, so we went, we descended fairly rapidly, a uh, little bit different speed with each of those submersibles, but we descended pretty rapidly and we deliberately did not turn lights on outside the submersible because that just consumes the battery power that we wanted to use on the bottom. So I uh, didn't really pause and stop to look for bioluminescence and we're going, usually descending fast enough that there, if there were any critters out there, they would streak right by you and just be a blur. Um, the mapping of uh, the seabed and the mapping of the oceans. Uh, again, we have a, another question, I believe, on, on this one. And that is only 6% of the entire ocean has been mapped and there's an enormous amount we do not know. How do we learn more? That's a question from Lorclo Canadia in Dingle in County Kerry. Yeah, it's a, it's a very good and a very important question, actually. Uh, there are a couple things that I think need to happen. One is, I mean, 6% is takes a lot of ship time if you're measuring the bottom of the ocean by sonar from the surface ship. Uh, so we've got to begin to take better advantage of uh, today's capabilities in autonomy and self-guided vehicles. And there's some very exciting new developments underway with ocean gliders and um, autonomous uh, vehicles that you can, you can program them and they will go off underwater and uh, do much more mapping in a concerted period of time than can be done from the surface ship. So we need to scale up to where we have fleets of these operating continuously throughout the ocean. And, and then we also need to get to some a state where we've got a data system that works more like an, as the API system we know in our internet world, that every bit of data that any institution or any craft collects is instantly externalizable, it's visible, it, it becomes part of a whole jigsaw puzzle, not my little not my little data collection that's sort of isolated over here. Uh, because that's one of the challenges with the oceanographic data is each expedition becomes a little pocket of data that does not co collect, connect readily and extensively with all the rest of the data. Uh, the, the question of the destruction of the oceans, the destruction of me marine life, overfishing, and then pollution. Uh, it seems that even in the most exotic and distant parts of the oceans, we now find plastics. What are we to do? Well, the, for plastics, part of the question is to start working on the source terms uh, and get radically better at controlling plastic debris, let it not come down in streams and, and run into the ocean. Another scale, the other end of the scale, the question is uh, microplastics. Uh, and that is a much thornier, much, much thornier problem. I just saw a paper the other day 
reporting about microplastics in organisms in the very high Arctic that appear to have been transported there on uh, particles, basically particles of rubber tires. So as, as tires are burnt in dumps down in the populated world, the mid-latitudes and tropics, uh, some of that gets suspended in such fine particles that it can make it all the way up to Arctic latitudes before it settles out and gets deposited. So microplastics are gonna, a very thorny question that at, at present I don't think any of us have an answer to other than you know, you try again, try to limit that source term as well. But it, it, it is so ubiquitous and coming from so many sources, that's gonna be a, a real issue. But the question of overfishing, I mean, as the population of the globe increases, uh, the demands for uh, fish as protein, um, the seas are not inexhaustible. They're absolutely not inexhaustible. And the, the scale of effort that we now can mount with industrialized fishing capacity, sonars and high powered winches and high speed vessels, factory, uh, factory ships offshore, uh, we, you know, we can way outrun the fish capacity to reproduce. So that, that balance is out of whack. Um, managing the fishing effort uh, and setting it at a better level is one, uh, it's one piece of the solution there. Uh, setting aside more of the ocean as marine protected areas where fish stocks and biomass can replenish is another solution. Uh, and it's been well shown that uh, no catch protected areas allow populations to grow and spill back over uh, into the wider ocean. So you're, you're, you're helping assure that the fish have a chance to stay abreast of, of our needs and our desires. Um, we all assume that the earth is in some kind of perpetual stable state. And we know about global warming and temperatures edging up, but how important are the oceans in terms of the provision of oxygen for us all to breathe? The oceans are absolutely essential to how our planet works. Uh, they provide about every other breath you take. The oxygen every other breath you take uh, is from the sea, from small organi organisms in the sea that are not the charismatic ones that end up on your restaurant plate. Uh, it's it's one of the major sinks for the heat that's already been generated in the atmosphere because of increasing CO2 concentrations. But that CO2 going down into the ocean changes the pH, it changes the acidity of the ocean. So you've got both the, in terms of the global warming and climate change challenge, yes, you've got the heating up of the oceans, uh, the ocean has a heat sink, and, and that certainly can't be an inexhaustible heat sink either. Uh, how will that extra heat in the ocean affect the circulation of the ocean that moderates and sets our climate patterns? And then as the waters become more acidic, the small scale creatures, the plankton, many of which make uh, calcium shells uh, as, their, as their homes, their calcium shells will become destabilized. You need to think back to understand that one a bit. Think back to Rachel Carson's book, Silent Spring, back in the 60s. The, the trigger, the symptom that she was responding to was a decline in bird populations because a pesticide called DDT was causing the shells of their eggs to become so thin that chicks were dying instead of hatching into healthy birds. So the removal of DDT helped, helped reverse that problem. The acidity of the ocean is a similar effect on the small marine plankton that are the, they're the bottom of the marine food chain. They start the whole cascade of life that becomes the fisheries that we think about or rely on, and they are the source of a lot of the oxygen in the ocean. That's the slice of the food chain that's jeopardized by increasing acidity. And any other shellfish, by the way, if you're an oyster farmer or a shellfish farmer anywhere in the world, uh, your, your young shellfish are not going to be able to grow their shells very well if the water becomes acidic, even slightly acidic. Now, when you're working in the oceanographic area and you're looking at currents and marine life and pollution and all of that, I was wondering, you know, how often you harked back to your view of planet Earth from above, one of the relatively few uh, members of humankind who've actually had that view and whether or not it helps you more understand, you know, you can look at the science, you can look at the textbooks, but when you watch it in, in real time from a distance and see the way the currents move and see the way the storms are for, forming, see the way, you know, rain is not falling on desert areas and so on, you must be unique in that uh, sense of understanding the way the whole system works. Yeah, it's a, 
it, it's a common touchstone. I, I return to it probably every single day and certainly talking to every audience I speak to, somehow I work that in because it, because it is so meaningful and powerful to me and it connects so well uh, with everyone. I mean, this is our home. It, it's like showing any human being a picture of your house. This is where you live. This is us. Uh, this, this is the only planet that we have. Um, there's not only the value and the power of, of the view that I had, and, and, and even as a scientist with years of data and study and experience behind me, to see the Earth from that vantage point myself, really, it seemed to crystallize or you know, add greater uh, depth and insight to everything I had studied and known through intellectual pursuits beforehand. Uh, it's a powerful integrative experience. So I refer to that a lot. I share the, the out the window views uh, that I had. But the other thing I rely on quite a bit is we do all have a certain uh, orbital view of the Earth available to us fairly commonly because we live in the age of satellites. We see a satellite image of weather patterns on our television every evening if we want. We can call up on our computer satellite images and animations that show satellite data through time. They're, they're spectacular animations. You can watch the planet breathe. You can watch the planet go from season to season and see the northern hemisphere flower and the decline as the winter comes on. You can watch ocean circulation. Uh, it's So we, we have this extraordinary and first ever in the history of the planet capacity at our fingertips now to see the earth as a whole, to monitor its systems and see their interconnections, to start to really understand their dynamics. And if you take that and add the supercomputing capacity of today, that's what allows us to have some foresight, some predictive capability about what to expect tomorrow or the day after or 10 years from now. That foresight about the conditions on the planet in the future is an extraordinary capacity that never existed before the space age. Now, um, the other accolade, besides being the first American woman to walk in space, the other accolade is going to Challenger Deep. First of all, how deep is Challenger Deep? Where is it? And what was it like? Uh, the Challenger Deep is at the southern part of the Marianas Trench, which is an, an arc, uh, a big bit, a big gash in the deep sea floor that arcs around the Marianas Island. It's about 200 miles southwest of Guam and about 600 miles east of the Philippines. Uh, middle of nowhere kind of place. It's uh, just shy of 11 kilometers deep, which is just shy of 36,000 feet, uh, round numbers in English units, seven miles down. And the pressures down there must be incredible. So you've got to have as much confidence in your submersible as you had in the shuttle. Yeah, exactly. I mean, the, the a spacecraft only needs to design for a pressure change of one atmosphere from the one atmosphere pressure we have sitting here on Earth to zero outside. A submersible has to deal with one atmosphere pressure at the surface to whatever depth you're going to. The bottom of Challenger Deep, it's about 1,200 atmospheres. It's about 16,000 pounds per square inch. So the, the shape of your craft in that case wants to be a sphere. That's the strongest possible shape for such immense pressures. Uh, and in our case, it, with the limiting factor, which is the name of the submersible I was in. The sphere is about a meter and a half diameter, uh, solid titanium. The walls are 90 millimeters or about three and a half inches thick. Uh, and that's what lets it resist. I want all the heavy stuff outside and I want just the same conditions I'm sitting in here to be safely preserved inside. Now, was that a terrifying experience? It was a fascinating experience. Uh, I was able to do this at the invitation of Victor Vescovo, who uh, the the investor who funded and owns and, and had, had the Limity Factor designed. Um, I was dive number 50 in this submersible. So, uh, you know, with my engineering hat on and I, and I did my homework and checked up on Victor and the design and the operation to satisfy myself. These guys were squared away and doing things intelligently. Uh, but this is, it's the only vehicle on the planet that can go to any depth in any ocean repeatedly. The first dive to Challenger Deep was in 1960. The second dive to Challenger Deep was in 2012. So it was 52 years between the first dive and the second dive. 
we did three dives to the bottom of the Challenger Deep in seven days with the limiting factor. That's how versatile and reliable it is. Uh, but you wonder, repeated uh, immersions at these pressures, I mean, this metal fatigue, uh, yep. they'd be the things I'd be thinking about. Maybe that's why I'm not an explorer. <laughs> yes, and, and you do think about those and you check and make sure that there's a, a, a regular and very thorough uh, inspection program that's done periodically to check against and be sure you're not getting into those uh, kind of conditions. The sphere for this submersible it was of course tested before it ever was uh, put in real ocean circumstances and not just tested to the 11,000 meters of the Challenger Deep, it was tested to half again as much pressure as that. So uh, there's a good safety margin on it. Uh, a question from Michael Walsh on Facebook, having been to the bottom of the ocean and the top of the sky, uh, surely there can't be any more major targets on, on your agenda. But, you know, if you look up the word exploring or explorer in a dictionary, you'll find the definition does have a lot to do with, you know, moving about and going to some place that either no one's been to before or you've not been to before in order to learn about it. Uh, and that's a perfectly valid definition of explorer, but I think it's the most meager definition of explorer. Exploring to me is just curiosity in, in action. Uh, it need not necessarily involve running about and lots of geographical displacement. So I I doubt that I'll get uh, headlines as large as I've gotten for either the space flight or the deep sea dive. And it is hard to imagine some other adventure, that physical adventure uh, of that scale, but I'm not anywhere near running out of things to explore. Um, do you have uh, confidence in the future of space exploration? Because it is a money game and we see the private sector getting involved in launches and so on. And then there's the quest uh, for uh, perhaps a landing on Mars. Is that about the limit of the horizon in terms of going out there? Mars might be the, the, the only human target that's left. Um, yes, it's certainly the probably the only one for a very long foreseeable future, I would say. Uh, but again, you know, there are, we know now there are oceans on uh, bodies like Europa. So in terms of further exploring how our soul, even just our solar system works, there are a lot of targets out there still to explore. We will probably do those robotically, maybe forever robotically. Uh, but, you know, that's a, that's not my favorite form of exploring to go robotically. I'm, I am one of those I want to go people. Uh, but the intellectual exploration, the scientific exploration uh, is very worthwhile. And uh, almost back to where we started, uh, Kathy, on, on Hubble and what Hubble has shown us about the extent of the universe and how far Hubble has helped us see. It certainly, when I look at some of those pictures, it makes me feel all the more puny and indeed planet Earth seem all the more puny. And I'm sure you wonder, like many of us do, statistically, has there got to be other life out there? Oh, I think statistically, the probabilities certainly have to be that there is life elsewhere in our solar system and, and probably elsewhere in the universe. Uh, if, if, it bears any sort of broad similarity to the structure of life on this planet, the likelihood is that it's bacterial. It's, it's microorganisms of some sort. It's, uh, as I joke with school age kids, the likelihood that, it, that life on other planets has a business card or a BMW is very low, but the likelihood that it's there. Uh, but Pat, think again, we discovered whole communities of life on this planet in environments that we, we thought were impossible to support life in the 1970s. The, the environments around the deep sea hydrothermal vents that support crabs and clams and exotic tube worms and huge mats of algae. And you know, when I started graduate school, it was known to a certainty that there couldn't be any such life in the ocean because there's no light down that far. We didn't think that, that there were organisms that could make their, their energy supply uh, by synthesizing chemicals in the absence of light. But that's how these guys exist. And they're pretty abundant along ocean ridges. So what other niches like that are there on other planetary bodies or even out among the stars that have just that right amount uh, of some, some chemical energy to provide uh, the reaction? Um, do you have any unfulfilled ambitions, Kathy? Uh, just to stay curious and keep exploring, but... Uh, no, I, 
it, boy, if I wanted to pretend that I had unfulfilled things on a bucket list, given all the remarkable experiences I've had the good fortune to do, I think I think probably I should be laughed out of the room. <laughs> well, it's been a great pleasure talking with you, uh, Kathy, um, live from Columbus, Ohio, talking to us at the Marine Institute. It's been a great pleasure. It's been both an entertainment and an education. And uh, once again, I recommend uh, your book, Handprints on Hubble, to all of those uh, curious out there. It is uh, both a, a riveting and an entertaining read. Kathy, thank you very much for joining us on this special occasion today. Thank you. Pat, my pleasure, Pat. Thanks so much for a great conversation.